disobey, can you lose the very thing that Jesus gave you? Hebrews chapter 6, you follow along as I read. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God, of instruction about washings. Now, by the way, all of these things, folks, were Jewish religious background, things they would have been raised as, as good Jewish children. They knew about these things. So he said, we're going to leave those. Uh, the uh, laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Since they again crucified on themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame for ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled. But, beloved, that just seems to... Oh, I just now noticed verse 8 isn't in there. I read this this morning and I thought, I'm not reading this right. Well, there's a verse in there that says that's not good ground. Okay, verse 9. But, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I know when I read a long passage like that, it's tough to follow along. It's, it's, it's hard to get all of this into your mind. But listen, it's the issue of whether or not God's going to hold on to you or whether or not you have to hold on to him. And you know, most of you are young, you don't realize this was a top song at one time, although nobody in first service had ever heard it. It was a song back in 1958 by Betty Johnson called The Little Blue Man. It's, it's a little bit like the um, uh, you know, time where we sang about Puff the Magic Dragon and all these weird things. You probably never heard this either. You may wonder why in the world I'm reading it to you. Hold on, and you'll see. One morning, while I was out shopping, though you'll find it hard to believe, a little blue man came out of the crowd and timidly tugged at my sleeve. I love you, I love you, said the little blue man. I love you, I love you a bit. I love you. He loved me, said the little blue man, and scared me right out of my wits. I hurried back to my apartment. I rushed in and I closed the door, but there on the desk stood the little blue man who started to tell me once more. I love you, I love you, said the little blue man. I love you, I love you to bits. I love you, he loved me, said the little blue man. It scared me right out of my wits. For weeks after that, I was haunted. Oh, no one could see him but me. Right by my side was the little blue man wherever I happened to be. I love you. I love you, said the little blue man. I love you. I love you to bits. I love you. He loved me, said the little blue man. It scared me right out of my wits. One evening, in wild desperation, I rushed to a rooftop in town and over the side pushed the little blue man. <laughs> who sang to me all the way down, I love <laughs> you. I whispered, thank goodness that's over. I smiled as I hurried outside, but there on the street stood a little blue man who said with a tear in his eye, I don't love you anymore. What 
does that have to do with anything? Well, think about it. You remember that time in your life when you didn't know anything about Jesus, except for those of you who were raised in the church? But, but for some of you, it was almost as though, like a little blue man, he appeared in your life and you heard about somebody loving you, somebody who, who wanted to be in your life. I don't know whether you heard it through Campus Crusade or you heard it through Young Life or maybe you heard it in VBS, but you heard about this person who loved you. Let's face it. We all kind of like to have somebody who loves us. And, and that thought thrilled us. And maybe at that time, whether you were 5 or 10 or 15 or 20, you, maybe you trusted Jesus for the first time. And he, he came into your life. And again, it was wonderful to know somebody was there. Somebody loved you. But yeah, there was that place you wanted to go. And you said, uh, Jesus, would you... Would you not come here with me? <laughs> you, you wouldn't like it here. You wouldn't like these people I'm with. And, and you kind of push him aside. But he, he continued to, to push at you and want to change your life. And, 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 and he just kept telling you he loved you in spite of all you were doing. And, and finally, there was that thing in your life that you just knew you shouldn't do. But it was like you couldn't take it anymore. And you did it anyway. And you just pushed him over out of the way. But you were afraid, and many people are, you were afraid that he might say, I don't love you anymore. I mean, people are. I, I, I meet with people all the time, so I, 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 I've done this in my life, and I, I, I can't believe God would love me anymore. And you're so fearful that he might say that. This passage, this is one of the most talked about, argued over, debated passages. And the whole issue is, will Jesus love me anymore if I sin, if I continue in my sin, if I push him away, if I push him over the ledge? Is he going to say to me, I don't love you anymore? Would you look at it with me? A little more carefully now in Hebrews chapter 6. And without being too melodramatic, I want to show you how this fits you this morning. You know, I said last week when we were talking about the debate over the resurrection. Everybody, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Jesus did. This is like that. There are those who debate this issue and Christians on each side of whether or not a believer can lose his salvation. And, and some say, you know, in their opinion, no, a believer cannot lose his salvation. And yet you've got somebody else on the other side and they may be, be very knowledgeable and they say, yes, definitely. Uh, if you sin enough, you can lose your salvation. And so then we, we look at the books, and there are books on the one side that say, no, a Christian cannot lose his salvation. We feel good, and then, uh, then somebody brings us a pile of books on the other side. I put people, and they say, a Christian can lose his salvation. Uh, 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 she can lose everything that, that she has in, in God. And then we deal with it in the issue of logic. I mean, we, we think to ourselves, if a man does not seek salvation to start with, if God seeks him and, and he's not seeking God, but God seeks him, and if a man doesn't earn his salvation, but God paid for it himself, and if God loved us even while we were yet sinners, and Romans 5 says he did, why would he take that away if, if it's his gift to us, if he gave it freely? And that logically doesn't seem to fit. But still there are those who say, he's not going to love you anymore. We look back at the example in the Old Testament and the way God dealt with the Jews. And let's face it, if you've ever had to deal with some of the passages and some of those things that his people did, I mean, Moses was up getting the law, and they're down in the valley, and they make a, a, a golden calf. It just doesn't see. I mean, I bought them out. But then you come to passages like Hosea, great love story, 
Hosea 11, verses 8 and 9, and God says, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? Ephraim was the, the largest tribe, and so many times God spoke of all of Israel just by using Ephraim. How can I surrender you, O Israel? They had sinned against him. How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? Those were places that he had judged, had condemned, and sent his judgment. But God says, how can I do that to you? You're my people. My heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God. And not a man, but the Holy One in your midst, I will not come in wrath. See, as men, we say, oh, get rid of those people who don't do it your way. Except sometimes we realize we're one of those people. Oh, well, judge those sinners. Until we realize that we're one of them. And then that question comes back. Can a person lose his or her salvation. And then there's always somebody who says, I don't care what you've heard, I don't care what the logic is, let's go to the Bible passages. Doesn't matter what your reasoning is, doesn't matter how many books you read, or quote, or the passages you take out of context, God's Word says clearly that you can lose your salvation. Take Hebrews 6, for example. Here we are. Take Hebrews 6 for an example. It says we can lose our salvation. And I say, no. No, it doesn't teach that at all. And yet, it is used again and again to prove that. You may not necessarily agree with my reasoning this morning. I will take you through it. But I think it just goes completely with the rest of the book of Hebrews that God is speaking to his people in, in their problem of being Jewish Christians, being persecuted. They thought they would go back to Judaism and quit doing the thing of Christianity until the heat uh, you know, was off of them. Then they could come back to Jesus. And God says you can't do that. Notice the passage with me. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, what's that talking about? Is that Christians or non-Christians? And have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Is that believers or unbelievers? And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Let me say before I move on, if you believe, as some people do, if you believe that this passage means you can lose your salvation, I will tell you this, it also means you can never get it back. That's, if you take it as that, you, you can't just lose it and get it back and lose it and get it back, you know, save, not save. But if you believe that, then forget it. Once you lost it, it's gone forever. Again, I don't think that's what the passage means. But you need to be very careful with the passage as well. I want to look at uh, what the author of Hebrews says here about these people and some, real, for you, sir, some preliminary statements. The first one, I told you from the very beginning as we started studying this book, one of the first things is you have to decide as you read through it to whom is the author of Hebrews writing? Now, you can have a lot of mixed groups, but basically, as you read it, is he talking to believers? Or is he talking to unbelievers? Or is he talking to believers and then he's also talking to unbelievers? Well, you've got to decide. And you can't wait until you get to the passage and say, well, I think here he... That doesn't make sense. To whom is he basically writing? What is the message of this letter? Uh, secondly, the second thing is you have to consider the context of chapter 5 before we get into chapter 6. So let's look at it. Chapter 5. Concerning him, and this is Melchizedek. And you might say, Melchizedek who? 
We don't know a lot about Melchizedek either. But the author of Hebrews wants to teach them about him. He wants them to know that Jesus is a high priest, but he's not a priest after the Levitical priesthood. He is a priest after the Melchizedekian priesthood. And they're going, huh? And he says, I want to talk to you about Melchizedek. We have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now, he didn't say since you've lost your salvation. Now he says you've become dull of hearing. Since you've become dull of hearing, for though by this time you ought to be teachers. Does that sound like he's talking to unbelievers? No, he's talking to believers. You ought to be teachers, but you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. Baby Christian that you are. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. He wants to talk to mature Christians, but they're not acting very mature. They can't understand. They have become dull of hearing. And then we come to chapter 6. He's concerned about their spiritual condition, but folks, I don't think he's concerned about whether or not they are believers or unbelievers. I think he is concerned about their maturity. They need to grow up. They need to move on in their relationship with Jesus. So having looked at that context, let's look to see what he has to say here in chapter 6. We start with the desire of the author of Hebrews, and I'll just say this for sake of time. He says, I, don't, I, I want to leave the stuff you learned as young Jews. All that stuff you learned about the placing of hands on the, on the animal before the priest killed it, all of those things you learned about washings and stuff, let's leave that and we're going to do it. He says, notice at the end, this we will do if God permits. If God permits. Are, are we going to be able to go on here, he says? And then he has this description. And I want you to look at these words of his description. And I want to take out all those extra little words, okay? So forget all the extra little words. Let's look at the sentence without them. Here it is. It is impossible to renew them to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. That's what he's dealing with. He's dealing with renewing somebody, them. But the question is, who is the them here? Who is it that it's impossible for this thing to happen with? That's what we have to decide. So let's look at the sentence and put those descriptions back in and ask ourselves, is this believers or unbelievers? Now, uh, let me move on here because we're going to really run short. He starts in verse 4. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened. Here's our question. This once been enlightened, is this talking about unbelievers who just heard about Jesus but they never really accepted him? Or is he talking about Christians? That, that's important for us to understand. The word once been enlightened, it is used by the Apostle Paul to describe Christians. Now we don't know if Paul wrote Hebrews. Many think he did. Uh, I think he was probably involved with it. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6, he talks about believers as those who have been enlightened. Read it with me here. Even if our gospel is veiled, Paul said, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of, unbelie of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glorious uh, glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts, in those words, 
are basically the same words in here. He has enlightened us. God's light has come upon believers. He has enlightened us to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So at least that phrase, enlightened ones, when Paul uses it, it's used to believers. But uh, let's go back to Hebrews again. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, the author of Hebrews also uses this term enlightened. Oh, is he going to be talking about Christians or non-Christians? Let's look at it. Chapter 10, verse 32. He says, and he's talking to these his readers, remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle for reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated? I cannot prove it in this passage, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that the author of Hebrews would describe these people as unbelievers. He's saying they've, they've been enlightened. They've come to the light. In fact, at first they went through the persecution. At first they were putting up with others. They were helping those who had been persecuted. They had been enlightened. I think they'd come to Christ. But the question is, is the author of Hebrews talking about unbelievers? Are believers in Hebrews 6 those who have been enlightened? I think believers. Let's go to the second phrase. And have tasted of the heavenly gift. Now here's this brings me to a problem and I, I hate to admit it but I am going to disagree with my favorite commentator. My favorite commentator is John MacArthur. He has done a wonderful job over the years. Doesn't mean I always have to agree with him and here I don't. <laughs> but I will never forget when I first came to this church and I mentioned that I disagreed with John MacArthur and a couple left the church. How dare you disagree with John MacArthur? Well, don't think I do it very lightly, you know? But I do here. Here's what he says about this tasted of the heavenly gift. He would say it means those who just, they, it's kind of like, you know, when you go to Cold Stone and you ask for a little taste spoon. You don't, you don't really eat all of that. You're just tasting this flavor and this flavor so you don't take it all in. That's what he says about these people. And I'll quote from him. He says, taste it of the heavenly gift. This great gift, however, was not received. It was not feasted on, but only tasted, sampled. It was not accepted or lived, only examined. And that makes pretty good sense. Except when you see how the author of Hebrews uses this word tasted in another passage. Because in Hebrews chapter 2, he said that Christ tasted death for all men. Did Jesus just kind of nibble at death? Did he just sort of mm, I wonder what it's like for humans to die? Or did he die? He died. He experienced it. He took it upon himself. So when the author of Hebrews has already used this word, for me to change it in chapter 6 to say it just needs to nibble, just kind of not really, I can't do that. I think it means those people had tasted, they had received the heavenly gift and he says thirdly they have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit you can't be a partaker of the Holy Spirit if you're an unbeliever but how is this word partakers used well I'm going to show it in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 8 the same word partakers in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 8 the author of Hebrews says but if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers. Now, here's his point. He says, you remember when you were a kid? You remember what discipline was like? Did you ever get a spanking? He says, look, 
I want you to understand that we all have been partakers of discipline. All of us as children received it. He is not talking about just knowing about discipline. I don't think there's a one of you, and I know you, you, you lie sometimes. Well, I don't think there's a one of you who ever got away with everything. We are, we know what discipline's like. We're partakers. We have experienced it. So to go back to chapter 6 and say partakers doesn't mean believers. It means unbelievers. I, I cannot say that. I don't think it fits how he uses the words. And then finally he says, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Again, we've already talked about this word tasted. They had experienced this thing. As, as Jewish believers, they had they have become Christians. All of the, uh, the book of Hebrews gives us evidence of that. But, with that in mind, I want you to notice, he says, or in the case of those who have once been enlightened, I think that's believers, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, believers, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, yes, saved people. And have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Okay, in my opinion, these words are being used to describe true believers. But what does he mean when he says it is impossible to renew them to repentance? Ooh, there's where our problem comes. Okay, you've got true believers, but you're going to say it's impossible to renew them to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. What does that mean? What's he getting at? With this, I feel a little artwork coming into mind here, and I want to show you mine. I want to remind you of what the Hebrew Christians were going through. Remember, these people are Jews. They started out their lives as Jews. They had always been taught in the Old Testament. But one day, apparently, from what the author of Hebrews says, one day they had trusted Jesus as their Messiah, as their, their Savior. They were Jewish Christians. They were Jewish believers. And that was all well and good until the persecution came. When the persecution came, and none of us like that, None of us like really to stand up and be slapped down for something we believe. Well, that was happening to them. And as you recall, in the persecution, they decided that they would go back to Judaism, back to the temple, and, and forget Christianity. Let, let, let's go back and we'll be Jews again. And then when the heat is off, when the persecution has stopped, we'll just do what we did before. We'll come back, we will repent, and we will trust Jesus. Hmm. The only problem with that is the author of Hebrews says that's impossible. You can't do that. You can't go back and say, now nah, I'm not a Christian. Oh, I'll repent again. I'll trust Jesus. I'll come back into the system. He says it doesn't work that way. That is impossible. Why is it impossible? Because to do that would be to crucify Jesus again. He can't be crucified again. You can't do this. You have to move on. You've already trusted him. You've already become believers. Move on with Jesus. Grow up. And he says, as he describes them, or in the case of those who have been once enlightened, going down to verse 6, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repent. In other words, uh, fall away, apostasy, can be those who've gone away from the faith completely, gotten rid of it, or it can mean to fall away, as they had. They've moved away from it. It's impossible to renew them to repentance. They can't come back to Jesus and be saved, since again they crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. But that's what they were doing. They were shaming the very Jesus whom they had trusted. So he says, Oops, go ahead here. He 
you're going to be disciplined for this. He gives us an illustration of it. The ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. You've got good land and it produces? Hey, it's good. It's a blessing against a reward, so to speak. Good land. But he says, but if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed and ends up being burned. Now that's what throws us. We see that being burned and we say, oh, that's like you lose your salvation and you go to hell. No, 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 no. He's, he's using an illustration here. He's talking about worthy land and worthless land. In the same way that Paul did in 1 Corinthians uh, is it 3 or 5, I can't remember, where he talks about worthy works that are rewarded and unworthy works which are not rewarded and are disciplined in the case of the uh, Hebrews here. Worthless. It's up close to being burned. And then he insists that they grow up and move on. Notice what he says. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation. You can't have something that accompanies salvation if you're not saved. He's saying, I, I know you're not acting like it. I know you're moving away from Jesus. Though we're speaking in this way, God is not unjust to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I think what he's saying in chapter 6 is if you keep doing this, you're going to be disciplined. That's why when we come to chapter 12, he says, you're going to be disciplined because you are his children. If you weren't children of God, he wouldn't discipline you. Parents don't go and discipline children of other people. It's because they were God's children. That discipline would come if they continued in this state they were in, in trying to say, I don't know him anymore. I don't believe him anymore. He's saying, what you're trying to do is an impossible thing to do. And he ends it by telling them, do you realize how much God does love you? Do you realize he's not going to come to you and say, I don't love you anymore. I, I don't love you because you didn't walk the walk. You remember back in the Old Testament that the Jews, he called them a fruitless vine. But he still continued his work with them. He still showed his love for them. He brought judgment but he continued to show them his love. That's the kind of God he is. If he isn't, you and I are in a big lot of trouble. Do you really understand, honestly, how much he loves you? I mean, think about it. The times that you and I have turned away from him. The times that you and I, like Peter, might have even said, I, I, I don't know him times that we've done the very thing he says don't do. And we're so fearful. I'm sorry, Lord. Please, don't take it away. No, he gave it. We didn't do a thing to receive it. He gave it to us. He wants us to grow up and use it and walk in it and live like it. That's why I keep coming back to this passage that I want you to read with me this morning out loud. From Romans chapter 8, verse 38, read it with me. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But still, I know there are people who say, I know what it says, but you can separate yourself from the love of God. Okay, I don't know where to go with that one. Seems to me that God makes it very clear. He did it from the start. 
He came to us. He gave it to us. He provided the gift. All we do is take the gift. He doesn't take it back. Nothing. Nothing can separate you from his love. That's the kind of God he is. Let's pray together. Your head's bowed and your eyes closed. I, I do have to ask you, though, are you, are you a recipient of his love? Have you, have you accepted that gift of salvation? If you haven't, you can do that this morning. It's a gift. All you have to do is, is believe that Jesus died for you and rose again and received this gift of salvation. But once you receive it, he loves you. He will take care of you. He will see you through to the end. Father, thank you for the confidence we can have in you. For we pray in Jesus' name.